Well, there's nothing more disheartening than to work so hard on your garden all spring and early summer, getting it just perfect, and then to have some kind of animal or insect pest come in and begin eating and or digging and tearing things up. So I thought I would talk today just a little bit about uh, some easy ways to help control some of these pests in your garden. We've talked about diatomaceous earth before, and basically what this is is uh, plankton from the ocean that has been dried out. In its dry form, it's actually like a tiny little particle of glass. So what happens is when a slug uh, or an insect crawls through, the diatomaceous earth embeds in its abdomen, for in the case of insects, kind of clogs up its breathing holes which are in its abdomen, and eventually that insect or slug or snail perishes from that. It is non-toxic, it is safe for use around children and animals. Um, I would say that when I use this in my garden, I don't apply it on a windy day. We've got a pretty good little breeze blowing today, and I would not do that just because it is very fine and it, it is kind of dusty, so I go out and use it early in the morning. Uh, I use gloves when I put it on, um, not because it's poisonous, but because it can be just kind of irritating. Another problem that I have had personally, and I think a lot of us do, up in the eaves, up in the rafters, carpenter bees. And these little traps work really well. You can see that there are, are bait holes basically uh, drilled right into the, the front face and actually on each side of this little unit. And what happens is the bee uh, crawls into that hole, can't get out, looking for light, comes down into this jar and is trapped in there. And one tidbit that I have for you about using these traps effectively, this just screws off, you can empty it, and then it screws right back on. But actually, the buzzing of the bees that are trapped in here will attract more bees to the trap. So you don't want to empty this until the jar actually gets fairly full, and then you can go out and, um, and empty the jar and, and wait until it gets full again. A couple of pests that we all have trouble with that are really difficult to trap. One because of its size, and another just because it's not attracted to bait, are deer and rabbits. Um, so I have found that the best way to work with deer and rabbits is with a good repellent of some kind, like liquid fence. I personally use really only liquid fence. The liquid fence has a really good stick to it. It will last through three or four rains and it's very, very bitter. So once they get a taste of it, they will pretty much leave things alone. I use this on flocks in the garden particularly. I use it on my hostas uh, if, if the deer are coming after my hostas, which they do occasionally, and I also use it on the daylilies. Now, let's talk a little bit about trappable animals. Um, there are some things that are pretty easy to trap, other things you may not want to trap. Um, but if you have a problem with, let's say, raccoons digging, and raccoons are really tough because they're the only, one of the only mammals that has opposable thumbs and they're incredibly smart. So they can grip things, they can dig, they can really do a lot of damage in the garden in a hurry. Um, most of the time they don't do it on purpose. They're digging for bugs, for, for slugs, for grub worms, those kinds of things. Um, and your plants get damaged sort of as a byproduct of that. And basically what you want to do to get something into a live trap is use a can of tuna or a can of cat food of some kind. And the smellier it is, the better. The important thing is with these live traps, you're just opening this door at the front. It has a little latch just over here and you're going to hook that latch and that door stays open. There's a plate back here toward the back of the trap, and when something comes in and steps on that plate, enough body weight will flip this little switch, the door slams shut, and your animal is trapped. So obviously your bait has to be inside the trap, and when you do that, you want to be sure that your bait is all the way at the very back. So you're going to set that bait in there first, then latch your latch, 
set this out in the garden and I try to just barely have it latched so that any amount of good pressure on this plate in the back will make this latch clip down and your door slam shut. One of the animals that has become very prevalent in our area in the last 10 years are armadillos. And there are a couple of things that you can use for armadillos. There are some products, some repellent products out there like this armadillo scram. It has a very unpleasant odor to the armadillo. If you have areas where they are digging and burrowing, you can spread this around and it will help to repel them. Armadillos really do an incredible amount of damage. They are looking for insects in the garden and in the lawn. If you have skunks or raccoons digging, you will notice small holes about the size of a golf ball every foot, every two or three feet. If you have an armadillo, and I know from personal experience, you will think somebody has played a horrible joke on you and just gone through your garden or your lawn with a rototiller because they can do, they are incredibly strong and they can do a tremendous amount of damage in a very short period of time. Um, if the armadillo repellent doesn't work, there is another option and there are these great armadillo traps. These are scent baited. Armadillos are not attracted to fruit or vegetables or live baits really of any kind, but they are attracted to the scent of another armadillo. So there's a scent bait that fits inside of this wooden box, and basically all you do is pull down on this wooden piece, hook this little hook under the eye, and it opens these trap doors on either end. Um, Armadillos tend to take the same path every night, so if you can figure out where they're burrowing and where their path is, they will take that same path almost every night. So you set the trap in their path that they, that they run regularly. They come in one end of the box, they hit this little wooden lever, the box, the doors drop shut on each end, and your armadillo is trapped inside the box. You can then carry it off Finally, I think a problem that every one of us has dealt with as a gardener at some point or another are moles. And most often when you have moles, you also have voles with a V, and they are two entirely different animals. The mole burrows underground, and we all know what a mole tunnel looks like in our yard, I think. The voles will use those mole tunnels as superhighways, and they will use the mole tunnels to get to places in your garden, and then they will build their own little tunnels just under the mulch, and the voles will come in and eat the roots off of your hostas. They will eat the roots off of your hydrangeas. Uh, I had a client call me one time and say, my seven-year-old Nandina bush near the front door is dead, and when I went over, we could take the top of the plant and just lift it straight up out of the ground. It had no roots on it at all, and that was vole damage. A vole is about the size of a field mouse, but it has big buck teeth like a beaver. And uh, so the moles then, which we're all familiar again with mole tunnels, there are a number of repellents that you can use. Most of the repellents for moles are castor oil based. Um, this one, this small bag, only 10 pounds, will cover up to 5,000 square feet of lawn. You use it in a fertilizer spreader, and it's 20% castor oil. And moles hate castor oil. Um, a lot of times people will plant castor beans in their garden. The castor beans are very poisonous. The castor oil um, doesn't cause any harm to humans or to pets or anything like that. So these granulated products are really good. If you get to the point, like me, where you just can't take it anymore, this archaic looking device is a mole, one of several varieties of mole traps. And this is basically a pair of scissor blades, for lack of a better description, on a very, very strong spring. So the way you're going to use this is you're going to look at the direction of the mole tunnel. And if your mole tunnel, say, is running in the direction of my arm, you're going to push this down into the ground uh, perpendicular to the direction that the mole is running so that when you step on this, uh, the top of this and set these springs, 
these blades are going to open up underground. And I'll show you real quickly how this actually works. You're going to push this down into the mole tunnel and then you step on the top of it. And down in there, those blades, and you push it down as far as you can. And those blades have opened up underground. So when, there it goes, when the mole tunnels through, it pops, it, it hits this trigger and it pops back up. And in theory, if, you, if there's a live mole running down there, you have just eliminated that mole from your yard. There are also some mole traps that stand up above the ground and have a long kind of spear-like blade. I actually prefer this for a couple of reasons. That blade has to come down with enough force that it goes through the ground to get to the mole. And while it is set, that blade is above ground. So if a small child or a pet gets a hand or a paw or anything under there and happens to trip that trigger, it can injure somebody or it can injure a pet. So, a lot of critters out there this time of year. It's high summer, the deer are browsing, the rabbits are browsing, uh, we've got slugs and moles and all these things, and it sounds like a whole lot of trouble to go to, but really, in, in actuality, it's not. Um, if you have a few of these things on hand, you can pretty easily take care of just about anything that might be doing damage in your garden. For inspiring garden tours, growing tips, and garden projects, visit our website at volunteergardener.org or on YouTube at the Volunteer Gardener channel and like us on Facebook.